if you follow my work at all, it's something I've said forever is that my goal is not to help every kid get to college. My goal is to help every student find a pathway to success that is meaningful to them. And I really think about how there are so many different opportunities for our kids that did not exist for us. And are we actually opening these doors? Are we actually trying to send kids through doors that we were encouraged to go through as kids? And even when I think about my high school experience, we were kind of ingrained that if you do not go to college, that somehow you were less than. And that was something that really bothered me and still bothers me to this day in the little messages that we send to kids. And I'm not discouraging anyone from going to college. If that is the pathway that any person wants to go, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. But there are different uh, experiences that our kids can have. And that's why I really enjoyed this conversation with Kimberly Miller and Shelly Groves out of the Columbus, uh, Ohio area. They, they live relatively close by. And they actually have, and I want to make sure that I read it right, a career, they lead a career technical planning district. And it actually has opportunities for kids that wouldn't be necessarily in your traditional school. But as you're listening to this, whether you teach kindergarten, grade 11 English, you're an administrator, there's really some powerful things that you can learn from in how you implement these ideas, these things that are actually in our classroom. And one of the things they talked about was how brave some of their students were to actually go into the school as both juniors and seniors, grade 11, grade 12, um, depending on where you are, and actually doing something that maybe their parents might discourage them from doing because the pathway is just a little bit different than maybe what we took or what we expect kids to actually take. So I really enjoyed this conversation. A lot of my philosophy really aligns um, with what Kim and Shelley share. So I, I, it might challenge you, may make you feel um, you know, pushed in your ideas, which is kind of the point, which is the hope for the podcast that um, we get people to really think about what are these doors that we can open for our kids? Because I know not only as an educator, but more importantly, as a dad, I want to make sure that I actually ha help my kids find opportunities that are meaningful to them, not what I think they should be doing. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And I'm having some technical diff difficulties here today. So let's see if I can actually get this stuff to work. But I am really pumped to actually uh, be able to join you here today with Kimberly Miller and refer to her as Kim and then uh, Shelly Groves, who are and I, 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 I know it's a career technical planning district. I can't remember where it is again. But I know that you're actually just outside. Uh, are you outside of Columbus, Ohio? Yes. Right. And so um, just having a really interesting uh, perspective on education, doing something very, very unique. And so if you could just kind of introduce yourself to the audience, tell us who you are. And Kim, we'll start with you. Just tell us uh, who you are and basically how did you get to doing uh, what you're doing today? Okay, so I'm Kim Miller. I am the superintendent of Eastland Fairfield Career and Technical Schools. As George said, we're just we're located just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Um, I spent the first 31 years of my career in K-12 education. So I've I'm new to career tech in terms of working here, but in previous roles, I've worked with career technical schools, and so we've really come to love and respect um, the opportunities that career technical education provides for students. So um, I, uh, I've also had the experience, I've worked in uh, urban, suburban, and rural settings, elementary, middle, and high school. I worked in an educational service center as a consultant doing professional development. And now I'm in a, in a career technical school. So um, I've, I've tried to hit lots of places in my career. And I have loved all of them, but um, the, when the opportunity to to come to Eastland Fairfield uh, presented itself, I decided I wanted to go for it um, and work with not only high school students, but we also have adult programming here. So we get to work with both high school and adults, and it, it is, it's an exciting place to be in an exciting time. So, hey, I know like my camera's going out and I feel so horribly bad right now, but most people listen to this on audio anyway. Uh, can you actually, Kim, before we get to Shelly, can you just tell a little bit about some of your transition 
from like a K-12 to this? Like what was some of the challenges that you had through that process? If any, right? Maybe you just like was the smoothest sailing ever, right? <laughs> Wait, so you, like, you, can ask, you can ask Dwight and Shelly and, and all of them about my transition, but um, um, like any transition, there's a there's a learning curve. You know, when you go from um, an elementary school to a secondary school or you go from working in a building to working in central office or from teaching to administration, there's always a learning curve. Um, and so there was a learning curve here. I'm fortunate to be surrounded by a great team of people, Shelly really included. Um, actually, I mean, Shelly really is my right-hand person. We, we really are a team. Um, I'm excited ab about that. Um, we, we clicked very, very early on. And Shelly has a career in career tech. And so um, I lean, have leaned and continue to lean on people like Shelly, um, who've been in career tech for a much longer time on the details. But um, the, the the leadership component, leading people, mm -hmm. working with communities, that's very similar regardless of where you are. Um, I've, I've learned, we joke, I've learned a lot about the difference between a VM and a VT course. Um, <laughs> so you I started- you're, you're, the, you're the only two people who got that joke, by the way. Exactly. I, I, still, no I, I, I still don't know if I totally get it, but I started using the terminology. Um, I, oftentimes in meetings, I'll be talking and I'll say, it, I'm going to stop now and let Shelly talk or, or somebody else. So um, definitely a, a learning curve, but I'm a learner. I love being in new environments and learning new things. And so while I knew a fair amount from being on the K-12 side and having students come to career tech, being immersed in it has, has been um, somewhat of a learning curve, but an exciting one. And I've enjoyed it. One of the things that I think about all the time is that in education, we often point to business. And we say like, Hey, look at the, what Google's doing. Look at what this company is doing. And then we'll actually modify things and we'll take them into education. And I think that's great. We should do that. But what I actually would love to see more is that business looks at education and says like, Hey, what's doing, like what's happening here. And the reason I bring this up is because your ability as a learner helped you adapt to a, a new situation. And I think a lot of times like where, where in, in what field is not, not beneficial. Do you know what I mean? And I think, having right. the ability to learn. Whereas sometimes if we're being honest, right? Sometimes we get stuck in certain places in education and then we're, we're like, well, that's what we do. This is what we do. So I don't really want to go outside of this. And it's like, well, you know, imagine a kid saying, well, you know, I'm good at grade eight math. I don't really need any more. So I'm done with this. Like we expect our kids to evolve and grow through that process too. So I, I love that because I think it's, it's important to kind of, acknowledge that that they're mm -hmm. some, somebody is listening to this right now and you know scared to like maybe go into like a new you know go from elementary to high school maybe jump from like you know teacher to admin or maybe admin to teacher whatever but i think that learning advantage is really important and i'm glad that shelly is with you right shelly who depending on the day is the assistant <laughs> superintendent or the assistant to the superintendent is that correct yes Does yes one of the two that's where right. you'll find depends me depends on Depends on what Kim needs that day, I'm guessing, right? Is that kind of how it yeah. goes? Right. Exactly. So, Shelly, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got to doing what you're doing today. Well, I know Kim is my superintendent, but and she did have a learning curve, but she has done an incredible job of, of um, just becoming part of leading our team. Let me put it that way. She's done a great job. Um, I came into career and technical education right out of my student teaching. This was the first job I've ever had as a teacher a math teacher within the district. I taught math for 15 years, um, then made the move to administration, was the assistant for two years, and then became the principal or director, so they call it. Um, was that for, was the principal for about five and then made the move to district office and I have been here. Um, I completely fell in love with career and technical education and I alluded to this a little while ago the bravery of the students that choose to participate in career and technical education. As a high school student, I, I graduated from a itty bitty little school uh, further south of Columbus. Um, that's a brave student that can say, I want, I want to make this jump, make this change uh, for my future. I right. could not have done that as a high school student. So I admire these students and what they're able to, to see the opportunities before them and, and go for it. So t t t go into that a little bit more. Like, what do you mean when you say like bravery, right? Like, like what, what's brave about 
moving into that class for, for people who don't really understand, you know, maybe that shit that's happening for students? Well, we serve juniors and seniors in high school. So if you take your typical high school student, uh, they're in the same school system, the same district for all 12 years. There might be a little bit of moving around, but right. usually you're in the same district for a while. Um, so when you get to your junior year of high school, actually sophomore year, the end of their sophomore year, the students that come to Eastland Fairfield, they have made a decision to leave a building that they are comfortable right. with, to leave schedules they know, teachers they know, mm. um, and, and everything that they know about school has been in that district. And they're saying, you know what, I'm I'm going to step out on a leap of faith here and I'm going to go oh. to Eastland Fairfield. I know what I want to be. I, I want to get a head start on it. I'm going to go learn a different way. I'm going to go. The classes are different. The how it's taught, what I'm doing, opportunities are different. I'm, I'm going to know no one at this school because my friends are going to be back at my home school in 16 different school districts with mm. The students coming in, I just think that is such a brave choice. And and I applaud them for having that courage. I don't know if I would have had that courage as a sophomore to be able to do that, honestly. George, I, I think another well. thing to add to that is we serve 16 districts, 16 very different districts. Our districts would be classified as suburban, urban, and rural. So not only are students leaving the comfort of their home school, they're they're intentionally coming into a very diverse environment with very diverse students. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that's wonderful, but it also is challenging because helping students, um, we only have them for two years. And so helping them to, to integrate and become um, a community of learners, it, it, it also, it, it takes a student who, who, if they don't have some confidence, at least they're willing to say, I'm going to build some confidence. So I can agree with Shelly more that we think that our students are are incredibly brave um, because for, for many students, the first time they will step out of their environment is after they graduate from high school. And ours are making that decision at ages 15 and 16. Like, I wonder, like, I'm thinking about this because, you know, listening to kind of the bravery of your students of doing this and I'm like, was I ever like that? And like, am I actually the opposite of that right now? I think as we get older, sometimes we're more scared of trying new things, uh, jumping into new, you know, it, like it, it's, it's me, maybe this is, maybe this is going to turn into a George therapy session, but I find it way harder to make friends. <laughs> right. I find it way harder to make friends as an adult than I was as a kid. Right. Oh yeah. Right. And so to, to like, think you're going into a totally new situation to be around new people like when you're saying this i was like okay like that's a nice thing to say but like really and then as you're saying it i'm like i'm a little freaked out like i don't know if i could do that and i was like that is pretty brave kind of thinking well, about that right and, and explaining it to like we do a, a, a like a welcome in may for the students that have been accepted and explaining that to all this to everyone because like well i'm going to be right. new but what you have to realize is everyone coming here right. as a jew everyone is new they no one knows anyone. So it is, it's also a clean slate for some students. If I was known as such and such a person, or this is what I was perceived as, I get to start over. I get to create who, who am I now? As I take this brave new step, I get to kind of recreate myself. I, I think the other thing, um, George, to think about with our students is um, and we're not the right place for all students. You know, it's certainly right. not the right environment. And, and what's great is we offer a different type of learning, a different environment. It's, it's, that's part of what makes, you know, we are different and we embrace that um, because not all students are the same and they all need to, to, something different. But um, I think the other piece of this is when students are leaving high school, I said, oh, for most students, the first time they step into a new environment is when they leave high school. Right. They're being encouraged to make that decision. The reality is not all students who want to come here are encouraged to do it. Sometimes they're discouraged from coming um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, and students will tell us that, you know, like, well, my whether it's my parent or somebody at my school told me I, that wasn't the right place for me. Because when students are younger, you know, we, we, as adults, we're doing a lot of directing and telling students what they ought to be doing. And so it, it's also um not not for all but for some they're really going against the grain of what maybe an adult is telling them to do right. because they know this is where they want to be yeah and that, that is like you know that i think sometimes even with best intentions we hear someone else's plan and then we kind of discourage because we wouldn't do it 
right? right? And we discourage others from taking that opportunity. So like maybe that wasn't worked best for us. And when we were talking before, when we were kind of like prepping for the podcast, uh, Kim, you talked about this and, and I, I've shared this, you know, several times myself. I think it's really important, but I, I really want to hear kind of like how you make this true to life in, in your organization is that I, I truly believe some of the smartest kids in school are terrible academically. And in part of our role is to bring out the genius in their kids, whether that genius fits into what we determine, you know, like what the adults determine, right? Like one of the, one of the struggles I've really had with education is the, the notion that all three of us in the space right now could all say we're successful, but we totally define that on different things, right? How we define what success means to us. But then in education, what we do too often is we def define success for our kids and we tell mm -hmm. them this is what it will look like. So how do you, how do you, how does your organization help, you know, kids bring out that genius, even though it's not necessarily, and I don't know if this is the right terminology, like a traditional track, like and I, when I say traditional, it's like what most people know or experienced in school. Right. And I'm not saying it's like a wrong track, but it's just, it's not what most people experience. So how do you, how do you bring out that, that, that genius in their kids, even if it doesn't necessarily fit into the perception of academics. And I know it's not, I'm not like you don't teach like English class or math classes, but how do you bring that out in, in your students? So if I can, you know, kind of preface it with is again, as we were prepping, and I say, I've explained this to a lot of people in a lot of different settings. We have narrowly defined what it means to be smart mm -hmm. in, in, in at least in our culture. So smart means I'm a good reader. I'm a verbal learner. I can write. I'm good at listening and retaining information. I can take notes again, all verbal skills. If I can do those things well, I can do well in, in the traditional way that we deliver education to students. So most teachers were really good at school because we're verbal learners. Again, we get, you know, I could memorize lots of things. Um, and so we've defined that as how you're smart. But what really got me thinking about this is the number of people that I know in my life who say I was a terrible student and yet they're hugely successful. They run their own businesses. Um, or, or whatever it is they do, they're hugely successful in life, but they'll say, I was a terrible student. And so I've been thinking about this over the years. Maybe the issue isn't that they were terrible students, but we only gave them one way to show that they were smart. So one of the things I love about what we do, and really this is work I was trying to do in my previous K-12 districts, is how do we make the learning environment more focused on how the student learns? So... I'm really good at hands-on learning. And I also learned this when I was working in an elementary school as an assistant principal. We, the, the way we were teaching math with these various units, there was geometry and algebra and all these. And I was watching students who were really struggling with some components of math, but when we got to geometry and they were doing a lot of building, I mean, they were just blowing it out of the water. They just, they just got it because that, they had this great spatial sense, but that didn't necessarily translate in another area. And so I think that what we try to do here is, or what we do here on our, what we call labs, so the career tech side, is students are learning by doing. So we have a pre-nursing program. So many of those students are gonna go on to be nurses or other things in the medical field. They don't read about drawing blood and take a test on drawing blood. Uh -oh. They draw blood. I'm gonna get <laughs> sick. I don't know if this, I don't know if that's the avenue you wanna go down with me. I'm gonna get sick. <laughs> but, but we don't, you know, we don't, we have a culinary program. We don't, our, we teach our students about how to debone a chicken and they might, we show them and demonstrate it, but then they have to do it themselves. And so they have the opportunity to learn by doing, and they have the opportunity to show their learning by doing what we would call performance assessment in that more traditional school um, environment. And so one of the things we're working on and, and, and Shelly's really leading this work, um, I best could lead this work with our team is, how do we take that philosophy of career tech learning and imply, apply that in our academic classrooms? We do teach math. We do teach English. We do teach social studies. We do teach science. There's, we, on our high school side, there's still high school students. They have to take all of those courses. And so really thinking about not what's one way that students can learn and show they're smart, but what are other ways that students can learn and then show their learning? Um, because I I think I, I had this conversation actually with the head of an engineering firm one time. 
how many students would be great at certain careers, but we've convinced them they're not good at something because they don't learn in a really narrow way? What are we, well, how are we missing out as society? Because we've, we've told students, if you can't learn this way, you're not smart. I, and I think that's, that's always been my argument is that we're trying to get all these, like we're talking about personalizing learning, but then we standardize our kids. And that, that's one of the biggest issues is that, you know, all these kids expect to be good at this, you know, this, this specific thing. And I think, especially in our world today, if you want, so for example, think about the notion of culinary arts, right? Kid goes into, you know, wants to be a culinary school. It's actually not even limited now that you could like, you have to go work in the restaurant industry. You could have a YouTube channel, teach people how to cook. You could make a brilliant living from home doing something that you love. And it's like doors open, like no matter what hands-on thing you're interested in, somebody has a YouTube channel that teaches that, that, you know, is making millions of dollars doing something they love, right? And teaching other people how to do that. And I think a lot of those doors, you know, kind of really start opening. One of the things I want to ask you about, and here's, here's, and this is, and again, George ther therapy session. So I actually, I am not a hands-on learner in the sense that I don't like pounding hammers and nails and stuff. Right. And I'm not, I just not that person. Um, but if you ever see me speak, I, I can create an amazing presentation. Like people have know me for the visuals that I put into my presentation, the timing, how I share this. And actually somebody pointed, pointed out to me, cause I never saw myself. There's like, you're actually a tremendous artist, but that yeah, that's your art. This is your art of how are you doing this? Right. And so like, I, 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 like I've always felt like I'm not really like kind of like a, you know, hands-on person. But then when I look at how I create my presentations, and how I create mediums and how I create videos and things like that. Then I started seeing that. And so like, how, how does, how does someone like, how, do, how does that fit in there? Because I think we have this perception of like hands-on it's like getting dirty and doing mm -hmm. this stuff. But I think a lot of times it, it is like, I, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm not drawing blood. I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> Neither right? am I. So, so they asked if they could draw it on me. And I said, no, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. No, Thanks, I'm so. good. Right. Well, it, and, and you're right. When when we say hands-on, we think of we think of traditional right. trades, and and those exist, and there's a place for that. And their yep. kids were really good at that. I guess when I think about that hands-on, it's more that real world. You know, that student who's saying, "Well, why do I need to know this?" And and mm -hmm. we should be able to give students a a relevant reason for what we want them to learn and why we want them to learn it. Um, I, I even think of hands-on. I, I was an I, I was an English teacher, so I'm you know I'm like you. I I'm a speaker. I'm a writer. I, I'm that verbal learner. I could do. I did really well in school because I that works for me, and I like learning that way. So again, it's not wrong. It's just broadening how we provide education, and so many of our our programs you know we have a number of it programs and um the students aren't necessarily getting dirty i guess the hands-on is on the keyboard you know on the computer right. but they're doing they're solving right, actual problems of the world not just remembering information to to put it back on a test so it's it's there's there's i think it's providing purpose for learning and that gets into more like adult learning theory well i need a purpose to learn um, and I think as our students age, as our students get older, what's the, they need purpose. But, you know, I said, this is not the right environment for every student. It absolutely is not. But what we offer is an opportunity for something different for those for whom it is a good environment. And, or as Shelly said, those who, who want to get a head start. So we have a pre-engineering program. A student who goes through a pre-engineering program really learns about the application of engineering principles. If they go major in engineering in college, they have a much greater understanding of engineering and how it applies in the real world, as opposed to I took physics and calculus. Yeah. Kim, do you remember when uh, that engineering teacher gave the presentation and he talked about, I'm paraphrasing, but success through failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're not afraid to, in our, in our lab specifically, to let our kids try it. Does it work? Okay, well then deboning a chicken. Success is, did you debone the chicken? Can you in the end, how you get there and how you learn to do it? 
however you need to get there, get there. But right. the objective in the end is you're, you're going to do this. And I um, think that's that's another point. It's not about the grade. You know, so much yes. of school is what's your grade and your grade point average. It, we'll, we'll stay with deboning chickens, probably because it's getting to be dinner and I'm hungry. So, right. <laughs> Um, well, I can I start talking about drawing blood and get rid of your right. Well, we're going to stay away from we'll stay away from right, that. Right. But you know, we don't say, "Well, you get a C in deboning chicken. You keep doing it until you are able to do it." It's it's again, it's it's a performance assessment, but it's it, that Shelley's absolutely right. Being willing to have failure, and I think what we know is the reality is we learn more through failure than we do through success. Mm -hmm. It's our struggles that help us to learn. That's what, you know, gets our brains thinking. And so I think, but I think we could do this in any school, elementary, middle, high school, private school, public school, traditional, non-traditional, really, right. it's really changing a mindset about what school has to look like. And that was actually going to be, and I'll, I'll ask, I'm going to ask you this one, Shelly, because Kim mentioned this. Um, so when you're saying this, and I think this is important that the, the program that you're offering and the school that you're offering is not for everyone, but I also think there's things in the way that you deliver that is, can be for everyone because, you know, I, I don't want someone listening to say, well, I don't teach at that school. So like, how is this beneficial to me? Right. I think a lot of the things that you talk about are actually beneficial to the traditional track for lack of a better term. So like Shelly, how do you see some of the principles, some of the things that you do in your um, your organization that are actually would be beneficial no matter where you went to school? First, as Kim had alluded to, we're working right now um, on our academic with our academic instructors and, and working at um, inquiry based learning, getting kids to ask questions. How do you answer those questions? How can you how can you get to an end result and just pushing them beyond the textbook, the pen and the paper? Mm -hmm. um, one thing is, as Kim was talking earlier, I kept thinking our lab instructors are not trained teachers. So the people that are teaching our students, whether it be, how do you debone a chicken? How do you, how do you raise the roof in terms of construction, not in music, right. um, but, but how the people that are coming to teach those, they're coming directly from business and industry. And in their mind, failure is not an option. Right. If you're going into this career field, you can't say, well, I tried to debone the chicken. I didn't get it all, right. but here you go. Right. You do it and you help. You do whatever you can. These teachers are incredible. I'll do whatever I can to help you get there. So I know that you know how to debone a chicken. And when I'm putting you out there, you're going to be successful. So but, but just but short term failure is OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The short term failure right. is right. just part of learning. That's the learning process. But at the okay. end, we're not going to let you fail and go, all right, you get an F in deboning chicken. Let's move on to the next yeah. thing. Or, that's hey, that. we raised the roof, but it fell. Right. <laughs> OK, that's a D minus. Yeah, that's you know, probably we don't do that, but not quite. Yeah. And that's been one of my contentions all the time is that we, we do talk about failure, but I think the, the, the more important aspect of is the resiliency is the getting back up is the figuring out from that process. Right. Because you don't want someone who's not had that experience, you know, and to actually then actually build a house, actually like, you know, debone a chicken and then someone chokes at your restaurant, probably not the best thing. Right. And kind of like looking at, um, that process. I, I'm actually, I, I have an idea here and I don't know if you'd be open to it. If I was to talk to your students. Um, what would they say is like the biggest transition for them? And there's like, there's a reason I'm asking this question, like biggest transition for them coming to your program for them. Other than obviously new environments, new people, but like what changes for the learning experience for them? I, I would several and feedback that I've gotten over the years. Our students feel like they're treated like adults. We do very much um, have the focus of, if this happened in, in the workplace, any discipline issue, okay, could do you think you could do this on the job site? No matter what your job is, mm -hmm. do you think you could do that? We have a very heavy focus on whatever your next step is. As you move out of high school, would that be appropriate? And a lot of the feedback I hear is, you treat us, we treat them like they're adults. They probably probably appreciate that. Here's here's why I'm asking this question. You know, I was thinking as I'm talking to you, uh, I would, uh, you know, obviously Dwight Carter and I. Dwight works with you. He's a very good friend of mine. 
-hmm. I would love Dwight to be on the podcast with a couple of your students. And I'd actually love to talk oh, to them yeah. about their experience. And, and so if you're open to that, um, yeah. I think that'd be really interesting because yeah. I, I do want to hear about um, their experience, their viewpoint, kind of some of the transition that actually, so I don't know, I kind of put you on the spot because I'm actually like, can't really say no because I'm recording this, right? So you're kind of stuck. Well, I but could. I, but, well, you could. I, could give, I could give some federal law why we can't do it. Right, that's fair. Right, right. But yeah, hey, look, I'm in Canada, so I'm sorry. Your federal law doesn't apply here. <laughs> this is the lawless country over here. We just do whatever we want. I will tell you, George, um, I have a student advisory group at each of yeah. our two campuses. And and so I think, you know, we, we take really seriously the importance of talking to students and um, yeah. have worked really hard at developing those those student leadership groups. Um, in my student advisory groups, I just basically said, are you interested in being part of sharing your perspectives and your ideas? Yep. You know, I don't I don't look at their grades. I don't I just want to know if they're interested. Um, and then, you know, did some limiting and, and even where I had to limit because I had way too many students that wanted to do it, which was a good problem to have is I said to the students, OK, you in this lab, there are six of you who want to do this. I can only have two of you. So you guys figure it out. And then they did. You know, I I said, figure out, you know, and then you just let me know. So I think that's important. And so I think, you know, obviously we have to have parents permission and whatnot, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be great to have, have students on um, because when I meet with that, those groups, they give me really, really good information. Yeah. And I'd love to, like, I, I've had a student on before and I just kind of like, I love hearing the experience, you know, from a student's perspective. And so I, I want to know, you, you go through this, you go through your school, and I know this is going to be kind of a hard question uh, because it is so unique in the path. Like what happens after, like, where do your students like, cause obviously it's very unique. Like where do they go after this process? And like, they have, like, they have experience, you know, on the job doing some things, obviously. So what, what typically, what, what's the path that happens after? So, so one of the things, and a lot of schools are using this, but we talk about the four E's and what's next, not what's forever, but what's right. the next step. So we talk about, do you want employment? Do you want to go straight to work? And we're, we're doing, we, we are actively engaged in activities that help students to get to their next E. So if they want to go straight to work, we work with business partners and make sure that we're, we're giving them those opportunities. Do they want to start their own business? So entrepreneurship. Um, a number of our uh, programs lend themselves well. We even talked about, you know, culinary, you, can, you, you know, whether you yeah. can have your own business as a restaurant or you have your own business in, in some other way. Like um, yeah. Do you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own business? Do you want to enlist in one of our armed services? And we, we actually send a higher percentage of students to the military than, than most um, schools would. Um, and so that's something. And they can often take the skills they've learned here into careers in the military. And then the fourth is, do you want to step into additional education? And we're really working to help students see education is broad. Education is not just for your college. They could come to one of our adult programs that are nine months long. So in nine months, um, you can get credentials that take you into great jobs. Um, some of our high school programs lead really well into this. We have a high school welding program where they get one credential, industry credential, they could go for nine months more with adult and come out with four industry credentials. So that's an option. They could go to two year school, they could go to four year school. Um, and our goal is to make sure that students can get to what they want to do next, but they're set up to continue to grow and learn. It's, it's, we're not just trying to get students into a job. We're not just trying to get students a high school right. diploma. We're trying to get them fo moving forward in a career and be able to continue to learn. So I may start out with employment, but then I go to school later or, or um, we have a pre-nursing. We are getting ready to start an LPN. You could go from pre-nursing to LPN to eventually to an RN program so they can keep building. Um, our students can do all the same things that a student from a traditional high school can do. The difference is their employment opportunities tend to be better because they already have job skills. So here, okay. So this is, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is like the airing of grievances. I'm going to say something I have an issue with and here's and not what you said, but I noticed, I don't, I don't know if this was intentional or not. You actually listed education fourth, not first. And a lot of times in education, it is like first, right? You got to go to college and all this other stuff. 
right? And I, I don't know if that was intentional or not that, but here is one of the things I hate this. I see it in schools all the time and it really bothers me is they encourage teachers to put out where they went to college on their door. And it like makes me feel like it's saying to kids, you, if you don't go this route, then like, like they're, it's like, they're trying to model something. I don't think it's about where they went to school and who they're cheering for in football. Right. Like if they're cheering for Michigan Wolverines, <laughs> right. They're not oh. big, Michigan, big Wolverine fans over there. Mm-hmm. But like, but I, I've always struggled with that. I've always struggled with that because it's like, what if a kid doesn't want to go there? And I feel like you're making them feel less than, and I think there's a lot of really good opportunities that don't necessarily have college in that path. And so like, I, I appreciated not that you didn't list college, but it wasn't necessarily the first thing in your mind, because I think a lot of times, like I, when I went to school, it was basically ingrained in your head. If you did not go to post-secondary, you were a loser. Like that was based, like it wasn't said like, well, actually it was, it was said to some people, but then, you know, but it's just kind of like felt it. I know a lot of people who never went that path and have done very well in their lives. And I'm not, and I'm not just talking, they have a happy family, which maybe they do. I'm talking like success business wise, they've done really good things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I just, I've always struggled with that because I, I, and I don't, I don't fault any teacher for doing that. Cause I understand the intention is to inspire kids to the next level, but I feel it sometimes just saying, but this is the level. And if you don't do this level, then somehow you're less than that's where I well, struggle. And this, that leads us back to that brave, a brave student and mm-hmm. Ken alluded to, there are some that actively discourage. Right. That's, that's the messaging. And I, and I think career technical education has come leaps and bounds the past couple of years and all the focus that it's getting um, from the federal government and beyond. But breaking that, that's a mighty brave student that can say, right. yeah, everyone's saying college, college, college. That's what I'm seeing when you watch the news, TV, it's all over. That's the focus is what college you're going to, where you're going. They just have a lot more opportunities when you participate in current technical education. I think we've, um, I, I agree. And I think that goes back to that narrow focus. Um, I did intentionally put education last, but it's all education. You know, right. this, we are an educate, we're an educational entity. We, it's just what we're teaching are some things that aren't traditionally taught in, in high schools, but it's again, we, the biggest challenge is, well, career tech is for students who are not going to college. Um, I was working on on a presentation that we're going to be doing on Friday, and um, we have articulated college credit, credits with 12 different univer- colleges and universities. Um, we have um, 11 different academic college, what we call in Ohio, college college courses that are taught in our in our high schools. They don't have to go to a university to get those courses. So, mm-hmm. you know, we we are setting students up for that. It's just that that's we've we've decided that the only way to be successful in life is to go get a four year degree. And I think what we're seeing more and more is that's not a guarantee of success. Right. It depends. What is your degree in and how much debt did you go into to get that degree? Right. And what's your right. return on investment? I think one of the things I hear more and more from our students, but even just students in general, is they don't want to rack up thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of college debt. And so some of our students will say, I'm doing this so I can work and pay for college. Right. It, it, you know, it's, um, or I want to do this for a while. And, and I said, then I'm going to go back and I'm going to add to it. Um, you know, the gap year has become very, you know, socially acceptable, which is, I think, right. a good thing because we're giving kids a chance to just think, figure it out um, versus this constant race to figure out what you know you what you want to do in life and so i think for the student who has some of the skills that we teach they can work for a while they can figure it out they can go back um but this is again our students have the same opportunities as any student it's just if they go to work they likely are going to a better paying job because they have a credential they have they have specific industry skills that they can take so this is something I've said forever is that my goal is not to get every kid to college. My goal is to help every kid find a pathway to success. That's meaningful to them. 
And I just want to say thank you for not only being on the podcast, but for opening those doors for kids. And hopefully people listening to this um, will see, you know, see some of those connections, see some opportunities. Um, but I just, I love the work that you're doing. I'm so appreciative of it. Uh, and I'm not, I'm actually not even talking as an educator right now. I'm talking as a dad, right? I want my kids to see these different opportunities that, that, and I'm not ever going to pressure my kids to go to college, right? Even though, you know, if they wanted to, if they wanted to, I'm not going to discourage them from that either. Uh, well, it depends who's paying, right? But, but I, they part of that too, right? Um, but I, I just want to thank you for, for being here and for, for the work that you do. So everyone, thank you so much for listening, Kim and Shelly. It was awesome just to sit down and chat with you. Um, I'm hope we get to connect and hopefully we can have some of your students on, uh, in a future podcast. I would, I would absolutely love to talk to them. That'd be great. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.